Hi, I'm Tyler, and this is the Fox Valley Film Critics. In this special episode of the show, we're going to be discussing the next in the lineup of the AFI's Top 100 American Films, The Streetcar Named Desire, as well as the newest Peter Jackson documentary, They Shall Not Grow Old. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to the show brought to you by Group Think Productions and FBTV. Joining us once again is our executive producer, Darren. Thank you so much for having me back. Glad to be here. And so... So, Streetcar Named Desire. Yeah. Um, this is the first time I've had the opportunity to see uh, the, the whole uh, piece through and through. And I, I guess in my own mind, uh, when you think about the classic movies, there are these moments that everybody remembers. And you think about Casablanca, uh, you know, play it again. Uh, you think about movie after movie, they have that moment that defines it, that even if you haven't seen the movie, that is so ingrained in culture, in pop culture, that it's, it's something that's out there. And Streetcar has that moment that you see and experience over and over again in pop culture. And then, of course, is the moment when Brando yells out, Stella! And I intentionally, I, I uh, brought that to your attention because I know you have a, a great collection of uh, Simpsons. And uh, they, uh, those of you who may not be familiar with it, there was an episode where uh, the good, good folks in Springfield put on a musical version <clears throat> excuse me, of a streetcar named Desire labeled O Streetcar. It's so bad. I just, I, the clip's on YouTube. If I were braver, I would put it right here in the video recording, but yeah. YouTube would just flatten this channel. Right. So I'm just going to put, I'll put, it's in the, uh, it's in down below in the, in the, the credits. Notes. Yeah, in the, in the notes. It's, it is the worst thing I've ever heard in my life. Like, everything you could possibly do with a streetcar named Desire. Yes. This dour, dark show about, like a destitute Southern Belle going to New Orleans for help, only to get thrown in the loony bin at the end of it. And it just, they just, yeah. And there's a, you can rely on the kindness of strangers. Like, that is the worst possible stuff <laughs> you could put there. That's like, you missing the point to a thousand. Yeah, well, which is, you know, musicals. Stella, music. you're putting me through, yeah. hella. <laughs> and by the way, Ned Flanders comes off as just absolutely ripped. <laughs> In, in that film, which is a, a, an, a, an homage to Martin Brando, who in this film was just a, a physical specimen of a man. And uh, this, this came at the moment where Hollywood kind of shifted uh, axis from like clean and like clean mm -hmm. cut movies to kind of the, the gritty. This is like, the, this is like pre 1960s gritty Hollywood. Oh, absolutely. It's, yeah, they t I remember reading in. Um, the biography of American Rebel, which is the biography of Clint Eastwood, that he was, they were looking for more people like Brando because of the success mm -hmm. of this film. They wanted like people that were like bad boy, rough around the edges look, and Eastwood almost qualified, but he had bad teeth. So they, so <laughs> they, they shipped him off to Europe and then he made his fortune, so. So it all worked out uh, in the end for, for, yeah, for Clint. But uh, kind of going back to the, to the story, this was a very successful stage play and ran for years and years on Broadway. Tennessee Williams was the uh, was the author, uh, I should say, uh, uh, produced it. Was the, the writer for uh, the, this uh, for the stage play as well as uh, wrote the screenplay that became this motion picture. And so back then, uh, it's kind of the opposite of now, where uh, there'd be a successful stage show, they'd make it to a movie. Now. A successful movie. Let's put it on Broadway! Yay! Frozen the musical. Yes, uh, and so many of the individual, basically most of the the folks that you see on the screen, uh, were th the people that played the very same role, uh, either in Broadway or in the London version of this. And so I guess one of the the to me one of the the true treasures of uh, the motion picture is the fact that this is one of the handful of uh, roles that Vivian Lee 
played on the big screen. Uh, most folks know Vivian Lee as Scarlett O'Hara uh, from Gone with the Wind, but her her screen life was so short and so limited, and and you just see, uh, you know, her go across the this, this screen like this, and it's just such an amazing piece. I was uh, listening to the the commentary on the DVD to give me so, get a little more background and get a little more augment this. And Jessica Tandy, who you, who folks may remember from Fry Green Tomatoes, uh, at the end of her career, played the role that Vivian Lee did on, on Broadway. And uh, Carl Malden was uh, on, on the, the DVD was basically uh, saying, you know, Vivian Lee brought a sex appeal to the role that simply nobody else could bring. Okay, what Jessica Tandy brought, okay was the other part of the character because there's more to uh, uh, Miss Dubois' character than just that, that sheer sex appeal that Vivian Lee uh, conveyed and was able to do. And it was, it was an interesting juxtaposition to think about all, uh, you know, the decision that was made at the time, uh, Jessica Tandy, Vivian Lee, Jessica Tandy, Vivian Lee, and they, they went Vivian Lee uh, for, for those reasons. So. Again, just some fascinating pieces here, and it was clearly something that uh, struck a chord because most of the actors, except Brando, uh, got an Oscar out of it. Of course, Brando wouldn't get an Oscar. <laughs> I mean, the guy did go on to become like one of the most accomplished actors in Hollywood history, but right. And as Carl Malden was also describing, was the idea that uh, Brando felt so constricted by his success in this picture, that he was desperately trying to do non-streetcar uh, name desire roles, essentially just because he was so deathly afraid of being typecast as that guy. And as we, you know, we think about what, uh, what transpired and the way his career went, you know, particularly <clears throat> at the end of his life, I mean, uh, you know, we talked about this is the exact opposite of a shadow of your former self. If you get my drift, the expanding oh. shadow. So maybe that's the way. The expanding shadow is for his former self. He was fat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, I guess that's uh, he, he's passed, and so the, the the rule is that you can't you can't be sued for libel if somebody's dead. So I'm sorry about that. The um, uh, but you think about Apocalypse Now, or even in The Freshman, it's like... Even a little in The Godfather. Yes. That that was that not that long ago, and it, and, and it kind of sad that way. A bit. I mean, he did kind of retread the role in On the Waterfront. Yes. Which, I don't know how much of that would be is a retread, because he's playing a very different kind of character in that movie, but... With Carl Molden again. And Laia Kazan, so... Yes. So it was, to me, that was an interesting piece to see, uh, you know, kind of the trajectory of uh, those two actors, you know, thinking about this as, you know, the, the various steps uh, that they had together. And, you know, uh, what was also fascinating is that, that you know, they, they, they had that history and they got to bring that on stage and uh, on screen with them. That's all the time we have for this segment. Join us for the following segment. We'll be discussing They Shall Not Grow Old. Stay tuned. So now we can talk about the cheeriest film of 2018, They, they Shall Not Go Old. So. Which is a, just an amazing uh, work of art that uh, it has a very limited release. If uh, you have the opportunity uh, to see it in the theater, uh, I was not expecting 3D glasses. And I was not either. And said, so, oh, you, please take your 3D glasses. Wait a second. World War I in 3D? What was that? Just that Simpson <laughs> joke where it's just like, eh, no, eh, no, eh, that was an eh. old SCTV. They the second city, they, well, they ripped it off of SCTV. Oh, sure, sure. So, uh, but yes, the th the well, so essentially, right? Ooh, ooh, that's so scary. Ooh, watch they, out! They did that in Hondo too. There's like three or four shots where like the knife gets really close to the camera. <laughs> wow, I almost got stabbed by an Indian. Ooh, yikes! 
so there was not 3D camera work on the Western Front uh, during the First World War. So essentially Peter Jackson uh, retooled, reworked, colorized, added a 3D component to uh, some of the footage. And they actually, you, they, as part of the little vignette they showed after, at the conclusion of, of the, the picture, was uh, you know pretty striking how they were able to recover so much footage that largely had been not looked at because it was either uh, washed out or too dark and they were able to retrieve images able to salvage images and film that otherwise had been lost and nobody had really seen for a long long time and so it was really uh, just an amazing uh, achievement and I, I think what's important to, uh, to note is that it was specifically commissioned by the Imperial War Museum in, in uh, London, England uh, to uh, to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the armistice ending the First World War or yeah. the Great War as it would have been known then. It's like the Simpson joke <clears throat> so where, where uh, Grandpa Simpson is like I fought in World War One. Why do you keep calling it World War One? There's only been one of them. Oh you'll see! But yeah, everything can be an ally, guys, uh, either through Seinfeld or, or The Simpsons. Which so, is in this, in this episode especially. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so what what made uh, I think this is all the more poignant was the fact that it was uh, truly done in uh, largely done at least in, uh, there wasn't I don't recall a narrator per se, other than maybe slides on the screen essentially advancing the story forward. They uh, the Imperial War Museum had. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of hours of interviews with soldiers who had fought uh, on the Western Front. Good grief, uh, yeah. And they used those voices, essentially voices from the grave. Uh, the fact that they could, most likely There's, none of them are still alive. They would, they would all be 120. So. <laughs> right. I think we just like they just lost the oldest living World War II veteran who was 112. Yeah. So that's add another 30 years to that. Right. And because of uh, that, it's even more pointed to hear their stories, To in, especially um, in the vignette, showed a video, or excuse me, showed the film of the soldiers as they were getting ready to, to launch the attack, and basically said, every single person that you see in, in the shot within 15, 20 minutes, a half hour, is either going to be dead or severely wounded. Yeah, I mean, that was part of the post- that was part of the they put at the end, right. of the, which is honestly that I think that is that's getting discussed almost as much as the film itself. If you like, list, like how I, they did it, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I when I posted my review on legal insurrection for this, like that was like half the discussion was like, did you stay for the end? Did you mm -hmm. stay for the end? Because he talks about the process and we realize just how many of those, as you're saying, the shots that just hadn't been that had been just so in disrepair that no one had seen them in 100 years. Yeah, you realize just how much of this is being seen for the first time. And how much the work is just spectacular. Like right. there, there are a couple shots that don't look like, that, look, that look like they didn't put enough time into them. But like okay. one, like a couple. But like most of these look like HD footage. Like yeah. eight, like in perfectly framed, perfectly. They they fix the frame rate so it looks absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. Which is that's just spectacular in and of itself. <laughs> I mean, the only the only complaint I've heard about this film is that there's no narrative like there's no central character or narrative to it it's just it's just kind of a mosaic right which which basically works but i i, I can at least see that point is that there's nothing driving the film beyond just the experience right with the scent the uh you know some of the most poignant images were of uh, the wounds uh you know to, to think about uh being in a trench uh ankle deep uh knee deep, maybe even higher in, in water. Uh, you know, think about weather like we have today here at the end of December 2018 where it's very, very cold outside, but it's not like you got to go, oh, let's, we're going to put everything on hold for a while. We're going to go get warm. No, you had to man the trench, and that was where you were supposed to be. And if it was wet, you were wet. And you stayed there, and cases of frostbite, severe uh, was called the word delve called trench foot. That's the grisliest shot. A couple of the grisliest shots in the film, yeah. which is the people that are completely succumbed to trench foot, <clears throat> like just open veins, open skin right. ripped off. It's just yeah, gosh. in in three D, and yeah, and even more uh, 
difficult to uh, to contemplate was uh, how they were able to do what they did and uh, the the heroism that was required to uh, to to make that kind of sacrifice to be there uh, when you're you're facing that when you know you're, you're <laughs> you may lose your feet. I don't think I knew they were going to lose their feet. I, mm -hmm. They just they noticed their feet were gone one day. Yeah. And so the, uh, it, but on the whole, it was just a, uh, a mesmerizing experience. The, uh, uh, like I said, there's no central narrative, but it certainly uh, went through the various aspects of the war that if you're familiar with the, the significant battles, whether it be the Somme, uh, whether it be Passchendaele, whether it be uh, the, the final push uh, after uh, the, the failed offensive, the failed German offensive in 1918, that there was at least that historical component built in, and you could you get a sense of where, where the story was and, and uh, how things were going to uh, continue. It wasn't specifically around any specific historical events, though. They, the way Jackson described it was just mm -hmm. that it's the experience of being a soldier in the trench, right. irregardless of what side you're on. Although it, it, it's specifically British related because they have British footage. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure there's it's probably German or, oh gosh, can't imagine how bad the Soviet, the, the Russian footage of this at that time would have been, because if they would have shot anything at all. But that was a, in, a, in the difference, of, that was a completely different style of war, that while there certainly were trenches, they weren't um, yards apart. There, in some cases, it might have been a mile or a half mile distance between the forces. It was much more mobile, much more... Uh, so what was truly unique about the Western Front was the trench, was the trench system, and uh, how the two sides for years and years and years were, were just stuck. And Basically they, indefinitely. Yeah. And that was a the, you know, great offensive. We, we, took, we, we took the other trench. That was a successful offensive, and we, we spent a million shells and uh, X amount of lives to get there. And then usually there would be a counteroffensive, and they take their trench back. So. Mm -hmm. Right. That's all the time we have for this segment. Join us for the final segment. We'll be getting his movie recommendation for the week. Stay tuned. Hello, and welcome back. Let's pass things over to him for this week's movie, this week's movie recommendation. All right, glad to do that. Uh, so this is a film that I discovered uh, in the Criterion Collection, and it was actually a film that I did see back in the day. As a matter of fact, it was probably one of the first R-rated movies that I watched. Sorry, sorry, mom and dad. Uh, called The In-Laws, but my sisters took me, so so they're in in some way responsible for this. Uh, so. Uh, the stars of the motion picture include Alan Arkin, include uh, 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 Peter, Peter Falk. Uh, Peter Falk, you may remember as the grandfather from Princess Bride. Alan Arkin is in all kinds of movies even till this day. Uh, uh, and so, again, the unfortunate thing is when I say the in-laws, do not become confused and grab the Michael Douglas Albert Brooks version that came out around 2003. Do not be fooled by imitations. Go for the original 1978-1979 uh, Arkin and Falk and it is uh, what, what truly makes this film funny is the fact that nobody plays this for, uh, for a joke. The, every single line is stated in normal conversation and the laughs simply take place because of the insanity of the conversation that is taking place. Uh, it, a bank heist begins the motion picture. Uh, the CIA, uh, in which case uh, uh, Peter Falk is a, is a member, and he uh, conducts this armed robbery stealing uh, from the United States Treasury uh, the, the devices necessary to print, uh, print money and he's gonna deliver this to a South American dictator essentially so this dictator can print out all the money that he needs to essentially pay off all the loans they've taken out, creating hyperinflation and killing the world's economy because he also has plates uh, to create German back, there's still the German mark, the French franc before the, uh, the Euro and the like. And so uh, there are chases in uh, New York City, in, uh, in New Jersey, 
uh, a very strange private uh, a private airline is introduced that uh, that uh, has Taiwanese pilots and a steward that uh, is in, in all Chinese explaining the uh, uh, how to fill up the Mae West, how to the emergency exits and like just wonderfully quirky moments. And because of this film, uh, you will never think of the term serpentine the same way uh, based upon uh, ba based upon uh, based upon the film. All right, that's all the time we have for this episode of the show. Thank you very much for guesting. You can find past recordings of our show at the Good Thing Productions YouTube page. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Social Curdi. That's critic without the C at the end. And you can find my written reviews at Geeks Under Grace and Legal Insurrection. I'm Tyler with the Fox Valley Film Critics. Have a wonderful day and a happy new year.